We have apologies from Shona Robson. And can I now ask the Lord Advocate to make a short opening statement for our evidence session on the challenges of reopening courts in Scotland, as well as the prosecution of crime during the COVID-19 pandemic? Lord Advocate. Uh, convener, thank you very much. And I do apologise that I seem to have lost connection uh, for a moment there. Um, I'm very grateful to you for inviting myself and the Crown Agent to come and give evidence to the committee. Um, in, in my case, as uh, head of the system for the prosecution of crime and investigation of uh, deaths, um, the word "unprecedented" has been much used in this context. But it is a simple statement of the truth that the challenges which COVID-19 has presented and continues to present for the criminal justice system have no precedent. Uh, I think it's right that at the outset I should pay tribute to the staff of the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service uh, for the remarkable work that they've done adjusting to new ways of working whilst complying with the restrictions which we must all observe to protect public health. Staff have continued to receive reports of crime to mark new cases and to progress the existing caseload. They are working with defence lawyers to resolve cases where that is possible. They have been keeping victims and witnesses informed about cases, and prosecutors have been attending court in person where that has been necessary to conduct the limited number of hearings which have taken place. Using technology, advocate deputies have been appearing in entirely virtual appeal hearings, and procurators fiscal have appeared remotely in custody courts. Two weeks ago, the Solicitor General argued a virtual appeal in the UK Supreme Court, and an advocate deputy appeared at a virtual fatal accident inquiry preliminary hearing. Uh, last week, three virtual summary trials took place. The service has changed very dramatically in a very short space of time. Uh, some 1,500 modern laptops and over 800 smart and mobile phones have been issued to staff who previously had no capacity to work remotely. Those steps were taken in response to a situation of urgency, but they are consistent with the direction of travel of the service as it has moved in recent years to harness technology in the service of justice. Uh, those steps will provide a good foundation for the service's work during the recovery period and beyond. This week, we will see preliminary hearing business restarting in the High Court, including some hearings to take evidence by commission. Two models of jury trial will be tried out in the High Court next month. At the same time, pursuant to a practice direction which the Lord Justice General issued last week, the summary courts will now begin to open up. I very much welcome these developments, but I also recognise that they are just the first steps to recovery, and that the pace at which the courts will be able to recommence substantive business will continue to be constrained by the public health guidance which we must all observe. It is hard to overstate the nature of the challenge which that presents for us across the criminal justice system. In the period since the courts effectively closed in March, a significant additional backlog of cases has built up at all levels of the court system. And the backlog will go on increasing until the courts are able to return at least to something like their pre-COVID capacity. For my part, I'm acutely conscious of the consequences which that has for the system for the investigation and prosecution of crime and of the human impact, both for accused persons and for victims of crime at all levels of the criminal justice system. Confidence in the rule of law is never more vital than at a time like the present. The Crown is committed to the fair and effective administration of justice, to respecting the rights of the defence and to fulfilling its obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights. And these are the principles which will continue to guide us uh, as we work on the system-wide response to the challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Advocate. And can I thank both witnesses for the recent letters which have been most helpful to the committee in advance of this evidence session. We now move to questions. Just a reminder to please allow broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before you beginning to you begin to either ask your question or give an answer. And could you indicate who your question is directed to, either the Lord Advocate or um, the, the Crown Agent? Our first question comes from John Finney. John. Um, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Uh, um, 
uh, Lord Advocate, Mr Harvey. I'll, I'll leave it to the panel to decide who should answer these questions, convener. It is about the case backload, uh, a number of questions about that. It would be helpful for our deliberations to understand what the latest figures are on the backlog of criminal cases. That's both summary and solemn. And how these compare with pre-lockdown figures, and what the current best estimates are for how this might develop, please. Lord Advocate. Yes, perhaps I can give an initial comment, um, um, uh, Mr. Finney, and then let the Crown Agent perhaps uh, give um, uh, a, a finer grain comment under reference to the uh, to the the, the, the figures. Um, um, the uh, and I'm conscious that Justice Analytics Services are doing a piece of work which will, I hope, help to inform with the best data gathered both from the court service and from the Crown. Um, the data that I have is that, so far as the High Court is concerned, as at close of business on the 4th of June, uh, there were 703 High Court cases indicted and awaiting trial. Um, in the Sheriff and Jury Court, at the same point, there were 1,564 cases indicted. Um, in the Summary Court, um, I do not have myself a, a, a figure, but it may be that the Crown Agent can, uh, can, 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 can provide uh, that figure. I think the key point, from my perspective, is that the Crown is continuing to process its existing caseload. It's continuing to receive reports of, of uh, crime and to deal with those. It's continuing to indict cases into the solemn courts, and it's continuing to serve uh, summary complaints. Um, and it follows uh, 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 inevitably that during a period when uh, virtually no trials have been able to take place across across the system. Um, that uh, the backlog is ha has been increasing during this period. It also follows that for such period as the court is unable to process cases at its uh, at or about its normal capacity, that backlog is going to continue to increase. Um, but perhaps I can invite the Crown Agent to um, uh, uh, give perhaps a more data-driven uh, uh, answer to, to, to Mr Finney. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Um, I, I'll try not to, to um, burden you with too much data, but um, uh, Mr. Finney's question uh, uh, is, is, is a good starting point in terms of um, uh, where we are. Um, going into the, the, the current crisis, as at the uh, end of March, we had across summary and uh, solemn business in the Sheriff and Jury and High Courts, um, 18,319 cases um, uh, uh, outstanding awaiting a uh, trial, of which um, uh, about 460 of those were Sheriff and Jury and about 390 were High Court. Those are the, the, the SCTS figures um, going into the, the, the crisis. I suppose it is worth pausing to reflect that those figures themselves represented a 14% increase on the same time last year. So we were coming into the crisis uh, uh, facing a 14% um, uh, uh, rise. Um, the current figures, uh, from the Crown's perspective, in relation to to High Court, um, as of the 10th of June, um, are, are slightly different. 717 um, have been uh, indicted and are awaiting uh, trial in High Court. 1,584 um, uh, have been indicted awaiting trial in the Sheriff and Jury Court, um, and that figure is up 11 per cent since um, the, the end of March. Um, before I go on to the summary figures, it, 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 it might help just to provide a little bit more of texture in relation to what those, those high court cases are, are. The 49 of them are homicides. 465 of them are serious sexual offence cases, 182 are major crime, and um, perhaps importantly from the, 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 the committee's perspective, um, 238 of those, at least one person, um, is currently in, on remand awaiting trial um, in the High Court. Um, 
similarly in relation to Sheriff Solom, um, of those figures that I gave you, 20 per cent um, have at least one person in custody awaiting trial, so that is just over 300. Um, and insofar as the, the summary casework is concerned, um, as, as the Lord Advocate has said, it, it regrettably, um, throughout lockdown, um, one of the truths is that crime has continued. Um, we have had um, a, a ongoing reports um, uh, from the police. Um, there was a dip in April, and I will give some figures in relation to that. Um, so in March, we had 12,450 reports. In April, it dropped to 10,063, but perhaps importantly for the committee's consideration, by May it was back up to 12,436. So there was a dip in April, but we're pretty much back up to normal levels um, uh, throughout May. And uh, our expectations from those numbers is that, that that will give us an extra 300 High Court and 1,500 Sheriff of Jury cases simply from those three months' worth of reports. And, and finally, um, in terms of the outstanding uh, 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 cases in the summary courts, given that we started with, as I say, about 17,900 at the end of, of, of March, according to the SCTS figures, since uh, then to the end of May, the Crown has served an additional 21,000 summary complaints across uh, the Sheriff and JP courts. Um, so obviously, not all of those will end up being trials, but that's an indication of the number of complaints that have been um, uh, served during the lockdown. Thank you. John Finney? Yeah, um, I thank the panel for these answers. I, I would like to ask about the impact that the COVID pandemic may have had on the ability of the Crown to prepare cases for court. Has there been any impact, please? And is there a backlog in preparation, or is the only sticking point the limited access to the courts? Please. Lord Advocate. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, it, it inevitably, there has been some impact, um, um, not least because those upon whom the Crown relies, the other services, forensic services and police, are also affected. Um, um, but um, the uh, and there was a, a period during which um, the Crown was readjusting to uh, remote working. And remote working poses some constraints, but um, speaking generally, and again, I, I will ask the Crown Agent to uh, uh, add his own perspective on this as Chief Executive of COPFS. Um, uh, all the Crown staff are equipped to work remotely. They're able, because of the systems that we have in place, to continue to prepare cases. And the Crown Agent's given you the figures for the um, number of summary complaints that we've been able to serve during the lockdown period, which is perhaps indicative of a, a service that is able to continue to function. Um, at a policy level, the um, focus at this time is on seeking to resolve cases which can properly be resolved uh, and on seeking to continue to prepare cases uh, so that uh, at, at the point when the court system is able to accommodate them, uh, the Crown is as ready as it can be. In the circumstances to, uh, uh, to, to 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 move the caseload uh, uh, forward, um, the critical the critical constraint uh, is the limitation on the court's uh, ability to function for very good reasons, which we all understand at this time. And um, Mr. Harvey, do you have something to add? Thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank my colleagues for the extraordinary efforts that they did make uh, throughout the period of the lockdown. Um, perhaps um, it, it, to, to help answer the question, um, throughout uh, pretty much 90 per cent of our staff have been operating uh, from home um, uh, using the, the laptops and other uh, kit that the Lord Advocate has referred to. Um, that has kept our, our absence rate very low, and, and our absence rate at the moment is 1.6 per cent, of which only 0 0.017 per cent is, is COVID-related. But at that, we have been able um, to um, continue to mark cases, continue to uh, uh, deal with every uh, uh, court appearance, whether that is an appearance at the, physically at the court, whether that is an administrative hearing, whether that is a virtual hearing. 
and also separately we have been able to progress the, the preparation and investigation of, of cases that lead to indictment. Uh, beyond the court element, um, which has been a significant constraint and continues to be so for understandable and intelligible reasons, the other um, uh, constraint that we anticipate down the line is um, uh, in due course as we increasingly um, rely on, on uh, reports from others, for example, forensic reports, etc. It may well be that we will need to make increasing use of the, the statutory extensions that, that Parliament passed in the emergency legislation, but at the moment, for the avoidance of doubt and for the Committee's reassurance, the presumption is that we will continue to indict to previous time bars where at all possible, and largely that has been possible. Thank you very Thank much. You, Mr. Hart. Yeah. The next question is from me. The Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service 2021 increase in funding was used to recruit five additional advocate deputies in response to increasing volume and serious complex cases in the High Court. Why was this deemed a priority rather than recruiting ad hoc advocate, de advocate de deputies as and when necessary? or recruiting more procurator fiscals instead, given advocate deputies prosecuted almost entirely in the High Court, but the solemn caseload of Sheriff Court is overwhelmingly greater, and also come summary cases, greater than the High Court caseload. And that would be directed at the Lord Advocate. And in terms of spending, how much will the increase in adv advocate deputies from 38 to 43 cost, how much did the 1500 modern laptop cost and uh, which DOPF staff received them? Also, precisely how many smartphones were purchased and at what cost and which COPF staff were these phones allocated to? And the funding question I'll direct to um, the, the Crown agent. So, if I can start with the priority question, please, and Lord Advocate. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, just for the avoidance of doubt, the increase in funding uh, has been spent on recruiting additional um, staff across the service. Um, the five additional advocate deputies are a small part of an increase in staff, both professional and um, support staff across the service, principally procurator fiscals. Um, it, may be that, uh, it may be that some confusion has arisen because I was asked a specific question in correspondence uh, about uh, the number of advocate deputies, um, and I mentioned the, in, in, in my response the increase in the number of advocate deputies. But for the avoidance of doubt, the priority has been to increase the staff the permanent staff level within Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and uh, those staff have been recruited uh, and uh, are, are in place. And again, the Crown Agent can give greater detail about that. Um, that was a response to the change in caseload generally. Um, um, the increase in the number of advocate deputies was a, a, a small part of a recognition of the changing complexity and, and, and difficulty of, of, of this caseload uh, generally. Uh, so far as the laptops are concerned, um, the service was fortunate to receive some additional capital funding uh, right at the end of the last financial year. Um, that was, uh, I would like, uh, that was fortuitous because that capital was um, to be spent on uh, technology, laptops, uh, and smartphones and the like. Um, and um, it was fortuitous that that capital was in place um, uh, uh, and was available to, for spend for that very purpose as we were going into the pandemic. And in the very uh, at the very start of the lockdown, um, those laptops were arriving and were being delivered to staff. So we were um, uh, fortunate that we were able to do that. Had it not had that not been the case, then we would be, we, we would be in a very different position. So, with that by way of background, I hope some reassurance in terms of the question of priority as between different parts of the service. I can perhaps ask the Crown Agent to uh, respond on the more detailed questions. Crown Agent. Thank you, Convener. Um, in terms of the, the distribution of laptops, the Windows 10 laptops, um, 1,976 of them 
um, were issued. Um, so all staff are in a position to, to work remotely if required. Um, and in total, um, 814 uh, uh, phones have been um, issued uh, thus far. Um, in terms of the individual costs of those, if if, if it's acceptable, convener, I'll write to you with the details of those. Absolutely, that would be very helpful. Thank you. And by way of follow up, Lord Advocate, um, you highlighted that the pandemic is significantly affecting the provision of diversion services to which prosecutors can refer accused who would benefit from such interventions, including, for example, mediation. However, isn't one of the benefits of mediation that it can be conducted remotely? and or out with the court setting. And finally, you also mentioned several times the Crown Operation and Procurator Fiscal Service works closely with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Given the SETS court estate where trials can be heard is finite, finite has this work included identifying other appropriate alternative venues for trials, such as those where fatal accident inquiries are housed outside the main court estate? And if not, why not? Lord Advocate. Yes, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, on the first point, um, um, I, I think the, the, the only point that I, was make, uh, 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 that I would make is that there are constraints across the whole system including in, in, in relation to the availability of um, uh, diversion. Um, um, it's fair to say prosecutors are continuing to mark appropriate cases for diversion, um, um, uh, 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 but, but, but I think all of us recognise the, 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 the constraints under which the, the whole system operates. Um, on the second point, um, uh, the Crown is working very closely with the court service across all aspects of this uh, of the response to the pandemic. Um, uh, that's both at a national level and at a sheriffdom level. Um, it's both uh, um, with the judiciary and uh, at, at official level. Um, Kavina, you're absolutely right to recognise that one of the key constraints here is the um, is the uh, configuration and, and size of the court estate. Um, and um, one of the issues, particularly once we've um, uh, the two models of so solemn trials have been um, uh, operated next month, one of the issues will be the extent to which um, uh, those may provide opportunities uh, to uh, use facilities uh, elsewhere. Um, ultimately, that's a matter for the court service, although the Crown will obviously uh, work with the court service. Um, we're also looking at the use of virtual technology that provides some uh, opportunities in relation to the summary business, um, and the Crown is closely engaged with the court uh, in that work. We, 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 we're, I'm looking forward to the evaluation of the uh, virtual summary trials that uh, were undertaken uh, uh, last week um, and the opportunities that virtual technology may provide for uh, a, a proportion of the uh, summary work. Um, and we're also, it's fair to say, we're, 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 there's also engagement in considering the extent to which um, uh, witnesses uh, and others may be able to um, uh, appear uh, remotely, and the extent to which premises um, are, are other than court buildings can be used for, 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 for that purpose. That's encouraging to know a list of alternative venues is being looked at actively and does exist. Our next question well, is well, from. Is that not the case, Lord Lord Advocate? Well, well, I, I I wouldn't want you to leave to 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 give the committee the impression that you know there there's a there, there's a specific list of alternative venues that uh, I, I can I have in front of me. I think the key point that the committee should be reassured about is that um, the Crown is working very closely with the Court Service on all of all, all of the options. What I'm interested in, for my part, is exploring uh, the um, uh, all the available uh, options that are uh, open to us within the constraints that we're operating within and maximising our ability to um, 
process and deal with cases fairly and effectively um, uh, within those constraints. Okay. Our next question is from James Kelly. James. Good morning, Lord Advocate and Mr. Harvey. Uh, in your earlier exchanges with the convener, you described how there had been a, an extension in the number of laptops and phones, and you discussed the, the costs involved. I think it's important to remember that uh, during this crisis, there are victims of crime who are looking for justice to be done, and it's important to keep the wheel, look to try and keep the wheels of justice moving. So, can you describe how that additional digital uh, capability has been used within the service to, to to allow the service to continue to operate and also to plan? for the jury trials that are going to be restarting in July. Lord Advocate. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, I made a point uh, a, a, a moment ago that had we not had the laptops um, and uh, other technology available, we would, we would be in a very different place. Um, I, I think the key point is that because the of the um, systems that the service uh, has uh, uh, already in place, and the, um, uh, the staff who are working remotely from home are able to log into those systems to work on the cases which they can uh, access through uh, uh, digital technology from home. Um, uh, prosecutors are able to contact and speak to uh, defence agents from home, um, whether by email or by phone. Um, and um, uh, it, it, in effect, um, you know, just as we all are working uh, remotely using email and, and technology, prosecutors are able to do that um, uh, 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 from home as they continue to uh, prepare uh, and work on uh, cases. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Kelly is absolutely right that um, uh, we're, we're all a, a alive to the human impact of the uh, circumstances we find ourselves under and the impact for victims of crime and, and um, of accused persons. And so the, the key focus for the service at this time is uh, to continue to process cases, as the Crown Agent has observed, to indict cases where at all possible to existing time bars, um, to continue to serve summary complaints and to prepare cases so far as possible, um, uh, with a view to them being uh, uh, ready uh, when we're able to bring them to trial. Um, so far as that's concerned, I'm very appreciative of the engagement by the defence. Uh, uh, bar um, uh, in all parts of the profession. Um, uh, the Crown has been uh, working particularly at High Court level with uh, representatives of the defence with a view to uh, 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 ensuring that systems are in place where uh, if the accused wishes to tender a plea, that can be uh, appropriately dealt with uh, to uh, seek to focus the agreement of evidence so far as that is possible and, and proper. Uh, we are looking at the um, uh, use of evidence on commission, which may uh, provide opportunities to take evidence uh, before we are able to, 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 to get trials uh, up and running in the solemn courts. Um, and so far as the particular um, trials that are to run in July are concerned. Um, work's gone into identifying appropriate cases for uh, those particular trials, um, um, uh, with a view to um, minimising the, 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 the risk that, for one reason or another, those trials are, are, are not able, in fact, to run. James. James. Thank you, Lord Advocate. A follow-up question to Mr. Harvey. One of the interesting aspects of the pandemic has been the way organisations have adapted the, the way they've worked in terms of technology. You would never have thought at the start of the year we'd have been conducting a meeting like this uh, virtually. So, uh, can I ask Mr Harvey, how within the service have you been able to identify potential opportunities uh, in new technology, perhaps looking at the way other organisations have adapted the way that they've that they've worked in order to take advantage uh, to ensure 
that you know we can best keep the wheels of justice moving. Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, it, it's it's an important uh, issue, and um, not only have we been um, learning from others, but I think that, that we ourselves made, um, as Lord Advocate has indicated, uh, some some really very good progress in the, the early weeks. It, it was significantly enabled by the availability of the laptops um, uh, fairly rapidly uh, to all staff. So within a matter of of uh, uh, weeks, everyone was was online and. Um, was in a position to to um, engage not only with our systems, but but also then separately to be able to to, to prepare um, uh, cases, as we've said already. Um, if if I might just pick up on on one or two points um, as folding folding in from earlier questions into into the answer, um, the on, the convener asked about diversion. Um, we continue to divert um, in the same way as we did before. What is different is that. Um, local authorities, for understandable reasons, have asked for a bit more time in order to be able to conduct the assessment about what is possible within the, the, um, uh, the parameters of, of, of physical distancing, etc., for diversion. Uh, but those uh, uh, continue. Um, similarly, in relation to our, our use of digital, um, there was a question earlier about, um, a, I think, from yourself, Mr. Kelly, in relation to, to the importance of keeping um, victims and witnesses engaged and updated. And again, with the distribution of the mobile phones and the availability of the kit, our VIA staff have been able to access our systems, contact victims and witnesses, and provide them with updates. Albeit, um, uh, given um, the, the issues in the courts at the moment, a lot of those updates will be about um, uh, uh, conveying the current uncertainty and the, the extended timescales. But that information is uh, being passed on. Um, insofar as um, it, Use of technology itself is concerned. I myself um, it reflected after four weeks of lockdown about the extraordinary leaps that had been taken, not only within COPFS but across the justice system in such a short period of time. There were um, uh, developments, um, uh, frankly, that have been trying to secure for some time um, that uh, uh, we were able to get through fairly quickly. Um, uh, so, the, the, aside from the use of technology, some really good. Uh, changes in relation to systems and processes, the legislation in relation to electronic signatures, transmission and service of complaints, electronic warrants, all of those things um, have meant that, that it's been possible to do uh, a, a, a successfully a whole series of tasks remotely that um, hitherto would have required a, a physical presence. And I suppose the other point um, that, that's worth highlighting the committee may recall um, from previous um, uh, sessions our, our CMIC program, program, our case management in court, the use of tablets in the summary cases. Um, they too have been um, really very significant throughout this crisis. So all um, uh, deputies who have been appearing, whether in um, the, the physical courts, the virtual courts, or the administrative courts, have had access to their documentation on the tablets. Again, um, whether at the court or at home. Uh, to enable them to conduct the trials. So um, we have um, uh, been in a position where um, we have been fortunate and been able to deliver the vast majority of our services um, uh, remotely, uh, but obviously with the difficulties in relation to bringing cases to resolution via trial um, still being an issue. Our next question comes from Liam McCarthy. Liam. Thank you very much. And, uh, good morning, uh, Lord Advocate and uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, it's following on uh, from the line of questioning from, from, from colleagues. I mean, it'd be helpful if you could maybe set out um, uh, the, the, where the biggest impact is being on uh, criminal court business uh, as a use, in terms of using uh, video conferencing uh, facilities. Uh, and perhaps, and I hesitate to ask this given the, the glitches we experienced earlier, where the, the problems. Uh, in that process, have uh, perhaps manifested themselves. Lord Advocate. Yes, the, the part of the system that has, um, uh, well, the two parts of the system, I suppose, that have successfully used um, technology to date are um, the 
custody appearances where um, s s in some of those procurators fiscal have uh, appeared uh, remotely and accused persons have also um, uh, appeared remotely from custody suites. Um, the other part of the system where the technology has uh, been applied is in appeal hearings, both in the Criminal Appeal Court and, and for that matter, in the Inner House and the UK Supreme Court. Um, I think um, the experience, uh, so far as I've had it reported back to me, is that uh, the um, appeal hearings uh, work perfectly satisfactorily. It's not the same as all being in the same room, but it works perfectly satisfactorily. I think there is a general uh, recognition across all parts of the justice system, both here and, and in England and Wales, where uh, technology has been used that um, uh, it, it, it um, requires certain adaptations, and it, it's generally more tiring to operate an entirely virtual uh, hearing. Um, the, uh, so far as the way forward is concerned, using virtual technology, um, we had three virtual summary trials uh, last week um, in Grampian Highlands and Ireland. Um, uh, the, uh, those are being evaluated. Um, there is scope for the use of virtual hearings for a proportion of the summary business, and indeed, it seems to me that's uh, going to be uh, a really critical part of the path forward because of the constraints that um, running solemn trials um, is going to place on the physical estate. So, the ability to do at least a proportion of the summary business uh, virtually uh, uh, will be an important feature if we are able to achieve it. Um, it's fair to say that will not be possible for every summary trial, assuming that the, the evaluation uh, is a positive one. Um, there are summary trials where, um, for a variety of reasons, it is important that um, witnesses and others are in the courtroom itself rather than uh, appearing um, uh, from uh, uh, a distance or appearing remotely. Um, um, and it's also the case, I think, inevitably, that um, the management of a virtual summary court um, uh, will uh, is likely to result in a smaller number of summary trials being uh, uh, dealt with by an individual court in any given day, simply because of the um, challenges of managing the um, uh, appearance of, of, of individuals virtually. Um, uh, so, I see the, the, in terms of future development of virtual technology that it's in the summary court that that's most likely to be uh, productive. Um, uh, in another part of um, uh, the Crown's work, obviously, fatal accident inquiries, uh, uh, it, 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 um, Chair of Principal Pyle has decided that the summary, summary of fatal accident inquiry will be dealt with virtually later this year. So that's another area where uh, that, that, that's possible. Um, so far as solemn cases are concerned, um, uh, 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 the organisation Justice has done some interesting work. Um, uh, using um, virtual technology for uh, solemn trials. It's fair to say that um, I, I, I am sceptical about um, uh, the ability to manage a solemn trial uh, entirely virtually, which is not to say that we won't seek to maximise the use of uh, remote technology for um, uh, where it's appropriate for the taking of evidence um, and in other ways. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks very much, Lord Advocate, for that detailed response. I, I suppose my, my follow-up is a follow-up to what um, Mr Harvey was saying earlier in terms of the changes that have, and the pace at which those changes have taken place. Um, we've talked about the number of laptops that have been issued. Um, while that may be um, seen in some senses as a, as a good thing, I think it also speaks to um, a, a, a sense that uh, perhaps the way of working previously was behind the curve in terms of where it ought to have been. And, and having been involved in the, the digital rollout programme within the Parliament, certainly the use of laptops pre-pandemic was seen as a way of allowing more flexible working, etc. So, uh, looking forward, do you think that there is now 
a, a mindset change um, across the Crown Office and Procurator for Fiscal Service that will allow you, as technology develops, um, to incorporate that into business in the interests of the justice system as a, as a whole. Uh, I've no doubt that that's Sorry, I have no doubt that that's the case. And, and as I said in my opening remarks, the uh, rollout of the laptops is very much uh, uh, with the grain of where the service was already going with the uh, the use of iPads in court uh, and otherwise. Um, and it was fortuitous that that um, uh, you know that was part of the planning in any event, and that we were able to accelerate it and bring it bring it bring it into to to, to play in the way that we have during this uh, uh, this the, the pandemic. Um, I, I've no doubt that it will continue to be uh, a key part of the way that we operate um, going forward through the recovery phase. Um, we, we we are acutely conscious that um, while physical distancing constraints are in place, um, there will be limits on the number of staff who can attend uh, physically at offices. Um, and so remote working will continue to be uh, a, a, a key part of the services operations. And it provides a sound platform for uh, moving beyond the pandemic into, uh, 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 as you say, um, different ways of working um, and uh, ways of working which are uh, more flexible and, uh, and and more efficient, all ultimately in the service of uh, the more effective administration of justice. We now move to Alistair Allen for our next question. Alistair. Thank you, convener. Um, Lord Advocate, this is perhaps a, a question I'm not sure for you or for the, the Crown agent, but uh, um, you touched earlier on, on summary trials and the um, the uh, use of uh, new technology, and I think it was Inverness and Aberdeen um, that would allow for more uh, virtual or for more remote proceedings. Can I ask um, if any evaluation, if there's been time for any evaluation to be done for those, and whether there's likely to be a, a rollout of, of uh, the same in other places? Uh, will we perhaps start with the, the Crown agent? Mr Harvey, would you like to comment on this? Thank you, uh, convener. Thank you, Mr. Allen, for the question. Um, the answer is uh, yes. There is an evaluation. I haven't yet seen the evaluation, and the intention is yes to 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 roll out. Um, uh, once that evaluation has been considered, that that will happen over the next um, a, a day or so. Um, if if uh, uh, we'll then be in a position to to, to give an indication um, uh, by the court service as to to plans for next steps. And. Um Alistair, does that fully answer your question, or Lord Advocate, is there any further comment you'd like to, to make, Lord Advocate? Uh, I don't think there's anything really I can add. Okay. Alistair, your, your follow-up question. Well, in that case, that's encouraging to hear that there will be um, a further rollout. I, I suppose that related to that, um, my, my other question was really about the legislative adjustments that have been made to allow for adjustments in the way the courts operate. Um, whether uh, you feel that those are sufficient or are being used to the full, um, uh, and whether you feel they have uh, any role to play in addressing the, the backlog, which uh, the Lord Advocate was talking about earlier on. And um, that's direct. We'll try with the Lord Advocate. Start with you, Lord Advocate. Yes, um, of course, the range of legislative change is well beyond the. Um, um, uh, expanding the facility to take evidence uh, remotely. The Crown agents also referred to the important changes uh, in relation to obtaining warrants, electronic signatures and the like. Um, and uh, the Crown has certainly um, embraced uh, all, all those uh, changes. Um, it may well be that um, as we're developing um, the solutions to the particular challenges that trial courts present us with, that there will be a need for further legislation. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think what we've come to appreciate, and it is an inevitable feature of the trial process, is that it uh, has historically involved everyone being in the same room together. We've made great strides in terms of pre-recording evidence um, and um, 
I certainly anticipate that we'll be wanting to make use of that facility as we're moving uh, through the recovery phase. Um, but it may well be that uh, Parliament will have to look again at um, features of the trial process that may um, uh, uh, may help to facilitate virtual working in the summary courts, uh, or indeed potentially uh, additional adjustments for for for, for, for solemn uh, procedure. <clears throat> Mr. Hart, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add to that, convener. Thank you. We now move to questions from Rona Mackay. Rona. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Lord Advocate and Mr. Harvey. Um, I'd like to ask about the prioritize, prioritization of trials. Um, in relation to solemn cases, um, you've advised that the decision on when a case should be scheduled for trial it is taken by the court. And can you say if this applies equally to sheriff, solemn, and high court cases? Is it the Crown Office that decides on the priority, prioritization of summary trials? And um, can you tell us how this operates in practice? What what advice you give to inform decisions, etc. I'm assuming this will be for the Crown Agent, my question. We'll start with you, Mr Harvey. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, so, in, per the, the correspondence that was submitted, the, the, the solemn case work, the prioritisation is, is um, set by the court service um, uh, once um, a case has been indicted. Um, and I think that we've elaborated as to the types of, of, of reasons um, that uh, particular cases might have priority. So, for example, if they are a custody yeah. or depending upon the age of the offence or whether there's a particular vulnerability, etc. Um, I, I think of particular importance, though, in the current climate is um, an additional element, which is that the courts will undoubtedly want to have a high degree of confidence that the trial can proceed. Um, and um, a, before before um, a, a, a setting it down a, for trial, and that, that's in terms of witness availability arrangements for taking of evidence, whether that's physically or remotely, um, and arrangements, for example, in relation to capacity, depending upon the number of accused that there are in a given case, um, might be limitations as to whether or not a, a trial can go ahead at present. And um, in summary. Uh, it, position. Um, again, this, this links to the constraints that we talked about earlier. We are anticipating that the, the vast majority of, of, of uh, uh, trial slots um, that uh, uh, traditionally existed prior to the, the outbreak. Uh, for example, in, 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 uh, in most courts, you would have a sheriff court, um, a summary court, with maybe eight trials in it um, on any given morning at the start of the business. Um, it, with virtual trial courts, we would anticipate that perhaps there would only be two, at most perhaps three, um, uh, trials set down for a day. So again, um, custody trials will be a priority, as will those involving um, vulnerable witnesses. But again, the court will wish to be assured at the procedural stage that arrangements are in place that um, a, the trial can go ahead, and that that even more valuable court time. Um, is 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 well used. Lord Advocate, do you have anything to add? I think perhaps I should just add this observation that uh, we've obviously had to consider, um, in particular, um, which trials uh, should um, be dealt with in July, uh, in the, um, the, the the trials that are be, be will test out the two models of solo, solemn procedure. Um, and um, at this stage, uh, we're looking only at single accused cases. We are not anticipating um, dealing with sexual offences um, in the early period because of the, the, the concerns about um, uh, uh, about cases um, being deserted for one reason or, or, or another. And we're looking um, seeking to. Um, Looking carefully at the witnesses who would be required for any given trial, uh, with a view to, so far as possible, one can never be uh, uh, absolutely sure about it. So far as possible, uh, uh, these are trials which should be able to 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 to, to run. Rona, your follow-up question. Thank you. Yes, just to follow up on that. Um, in relation to summary trials, you noted that the small number which proceeded during lockdown involved accused who were in custody, and you, you said that they did take priority, and um, particularly those given um, 
which involved domestic abuse. And I'm just wondering how you see the prioritisation of summary cases developing as more cases are brought to trial. Will domestic abuse cases um, still take priority? Lord Advocate. Um, it, it, indeed, I mean throughout this um, period, um, it, it, in all the um, adjustments that have been made, we've been acutely conscious of the particular particular um, uh, features of domestic abuse cases and the need for those to be uh, g given appropriate uh, priority. Um, so I, I would envisage that those will continue to be uh, a, a priority. Um, you're, you're right to make the point about custodies. Um, uh, in, uh, it's, it is clearly going to be the case that custody trials will um, uh, have the first call on the limited uh, resource, um, um, other things being equal. Thank you. Our next question is from Fulton McGregor. Fulton. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, uh, panel. I wanted to uh, follow on a bit from um, Rona's line of questioning and ask about the um, the resolution of cases without trial. Is there any is there any work that you're doing to identify cases um, which perhaps can be concluded without? The need for a trial um, with, for example, a acceptable pleas. Uh, Lord Thank Advocate. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, uh, the clear aim during this period is uh, to identify cases which can appropriately resolve, um, uh, uh, and uh, 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 I should be clear the Crown will only accept a plea if it's in the public interest uh, to do so. But it's absolutely right that we look hard at the caseload and identify cases where, uh, 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 which can be resolved uh, in the public interest by way of a plea, and uh, that we seek to engage with the uh, representatives of the accused um, uh, uh, where there's an indication that uh, 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 an appropriate plea may be uh, offered. So that's been are part of the work that's been done. The other part of the work that has been uh, done in relation to the existing caseload is where a case can't resolve, uh, doesn't resolve for perfectly proper reasons, um, that we seek uh, to maximise the opportunities to agree evidence, to limit the scope of trials, um, and uh, focus cases in a way that maximise our ability to, to move forward. And again, the Crown will use the various procedural facilities that are available to it to seek, uh, uh, seek to do that. Um, the other part of the picture in terms of resolving cases, um, uh, which I perhaps should mention, is the enhanced ability at the um, uh, at, at the lower end of the system to um, uh, use fiscal fines. Um, one of the measures that Parliament uh, has given us is it's increased the um, fiscal fine scale. Um, that uh, provides that as an option which is available to prosecutors in a larger range of cases. Um, and. Um, Again, where it's in the public interest to do so, um, uh, Procurator's Fiscal may uh, offer a fiscal fine in a case which previously would have resulted in a, a, a summary prosecution as a result of the change which Parliament made in the First Emergency uh, Act. And Mr. Harvey, do you have yeah, any Mr. Harvey. Um, so we, thank you, Convener. Yes, if, if I may add briefly. Um, there is a, there's a, a formal protocol has been agreed um, with the Law Society and the Court Service regarding um, a, a, a discrete process for pleas of guilty. Um, uh, uh, the contacts have been um, shared um, across the profession so that the prosecutors can be contacted. Um, and indeed, I wrote personally uh, to, to all practitioners um, indicating that, um, as the Lord Advocate has, has already explained, that we would be seeking to uh, where possible, um, resolve cases appropriately, and uh, otherwise, where that is not possible, to, to bring focus and uh, to agree evidence in order that cases were as, as narrow and well prepared um, in advance as trial as possible. Um, and I, I would say that it's still 
uh, early days insofar as that protocol is concerned. Um, and I would certainly, uh, whilst we had very, very good engagement from the, the leaders of the profession, I would encourage the profession generally uh, to engage in that process to ensure that um, uh, uh, as we go into the recovery phase, the cases which um, would otherwise always have resolved um, still resolve, and that we are we're left with the, the the recovery phase focused entirely on those matters which um, uh, should be going to trial. Bolton, your follow-up question. Yeah, th thanks for that. The, the, um, both those answers have uh, been really uh, really helpful. Um, in terms of the, the protocol uh, that was mentioned there, does the level of sentencing discount come into that? Is, is um, the possibility of increasing that, again, where appropriate, um, to encourage the early resolution of cases? Has that, has that been taken uh, into account or as a possibility as well? Lord Advocate? Important to recognise that the current um, uh, law on sentencing discount uh, offers a substantial discount, up to 30%, for an early plea. Um, and I should say, uh, I suppose before I say anything else, of course, sentencing is a matter for the courts, um, and the question of whether the uh, an additional discount should or should not be made available is something which uh, I anticipate that the court will uh, determine. Indeed, there was a case, an appeal court hearing on uh, Friday. It was a case involving uh, it was an uh, unduly lenient sentence appeal, an appeal which uh, I brought against uh, a sentence um, uh, 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 of a man accused of um, coughing and spitting on a police officer. Um, the uh, sheriff had sentenced that case to four months. Um, the appeal court has uh, increased that sentence uh, to uh, uh, ten months. Um, uh, I, I gather that the question of um, whether an additional discount should or should not be available was the matter a matter of discussion before the court. Um, the Crown position is that the existing discounts uh, already provide a substantial incentive to uh, accused who wish to plead guilty uh, to do so at an uh, as early a stage as possible. Um, but ultimately, the court will uh, decide um, whether or not um, uh, it is appropriate to allow any additional discount at this time. Liam Kerr, your questions, please. Yes, thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, something slightly different, but Lord Advocate, you just mentioned about uh, sentencing for coughing and spitting on police officers. Now, in a submission to the Subcommittee on Policing, the Scottish Police Federation said its members are exceptionally angry that neither the police service nor the Crown Office took a deliberate and unambiguous position that those who committed such assaults at being on police officers and staff during this crisis should be kept in custody pending court appearance. How do you respond to that criticism? Lord Advocate. Um, I, I suppose the first thing I should say is that we all regard such uh, offending as absolutely uh, reprehensible. Police officers are in the front line of keeping us safe through this pandemic, and I appreciate great the uh, work that they have been doing in that regard. They've been doing an extraordinary job on behalf of us all. Um, so I've been very clear that prosecutors will deal with such offending uh, robustly. Uh, we will take up such cases when they are reported to us, and we will prosecute them rigorously. And indeed, the case that I mentioned uh, was a sentence brought uh, on my behalf, an unduly lenient sentence appeal, precisely because um, uh, uh, it, it, it seemed to uh, the Crown that uh, the sentence that the Sheriff had imposed was um, not sufficient for the uh, nature of the offending. Um, uh, so there is no question that prosecutors will deal with these offences rigorously. Um, so far as um, uh, custody is concerned, we operate within a statutory framework that Parliament put in place in 2016, um, a, a modern framework for uh, uh, arrest, uh, custody, bail, liberation, uh, and so on. Um, that statutory framework um, uh, contains tests which require to be met 
uh, before uh, an individual can properly be detained in custody by the police. That's a matter for the police service itself to uh, to, to to apply. Uh, but it's correct that within the statutory framework that we operate, and it's not, it's a framework that recognises the presumption for liberty, uh, that it is not possible. It's not possible to have a blanket rule that uh, all, all individuals in a certain category of case will be detained in custody. And um, Mr. Harvey, do you have anything to add? No, thank you, convener. Okay. Um, and Liam, your follow-up question. Uh, yes, a follow-up to that answer for me, convener, because the, um, I understand, Lord Advocate, that there's a statutory framework, and, and I think the Crown Office issued guidelines on the 30th of March pursuant to that statutory framework. Uh, but the, the, the question begged, throughout this, this whole crisis, there have been various frameworks, there have been various statutes that have been reviewed, uh, that have been considered as to whether they're applicable during this period. And so the question begs really is, has there been any such discussion, uh, given the proposals by the Scottish Police Federation, uh, as to whether this is a position that requires to be at least reviewed uh, during this period? Has that discussion taken place? Well, and any change... In uh, any change in the legislative framework would be a matter for uh, ultimately for parliamentarians. Right. I'll put uh, the secretary then. Yeah. Um, can I uh, do a slight change of topic here uh, for a quick follow-up, please, uh, Lord Advocate? Uh, the Inspectorate of Prosecution is currently considering what work it should undertake on the response of the COPFS to COVID-19. Uh, can you tell us what discussions have you had with the inspectorate, and are there any areas you would particularly like to see prioritised? Lord Advocate. Yes, I, I have. Yes, I have the inspector's letter. Um, in the in the ordinary course, um, I, I would uh, discuss the proposed program uh, with her. Uh, my office is setting up that meeting. I haven't yet had a chance to speak to her on the uh, on the detail of that letter. I very much welcome the suggestions that she has made. I think it will be useful and helpful to uh, look at the way the Crown Office has responded uh, to the uh, current situation. She also, in that letter, identifies um, other pieces of work that she has um, either um, in train or anticipates undertaking, one of which is to uh, look at the way that the Crown deals with complaints, criminal complaints against uh, against police officers. Um, uh, that's uh, a, a, a piece of work that uh, a, a, that uh, I anticipate that she'll want to, 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 to take forward. Um, but I very much welcome her initiative in um, suggesting uh, uh, some particular aspects of the current um, circumstances that she might uh, usefully usefully examine, and that will help to help us to evaluate those and consider uh, how we take matters forward. Uh, thank you for that response, Lord Advocate. By way of a supplementary, the Scottish Criminal Bar Association highlighted the availability of multi-location video links with prisoners appear to be the subject of confusion with the, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and the Scottish Prison Service, um, where there seem to be conflicting guidelines. Now, I know this is something that the Crown agent has stated before. He was very keen to, to keep moving. So I can ask you, Mr. Harvey, if you're aware of that, and if so, has this um, this issue been resolved? Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Convener. Um, there's a really real progress has been made in relation to, to trying to, to deal with custody cases via um, a remote link, um, and a, a, a discrete group is dealing with that and expediting that work just now, involving colleagues from prison service. A court service ourselves, police and others, um, and there's a shared aspiration that um, a, all um, a custody cases would be dealt with um, a, by remote link in, in the near future. The percentage is increasing, and that work is ongoing. 
That's particularly um, encouraging. Thank you very much, Mr. Harvey. And that completes the questions um, for our witnesses. Uh, the committee look forward to the additional information that the witnesses have undertaken to provide. And I thank you both for taking part in what's been a very worthwhile meeting today. And we'll now move on to our next item of business. Agenda item two is consideration of correspondence from the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland, raising a number of issues regarding the impact of COVID-19 on those in prisons and young offenders institutions. I refer members to paper three and ask members if they have any comments or views or um, if they consider any action that they would like to take. Um, I remind members that one possible action is to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service to ask them to respond to issues raised. Do members have any comments? John. Thank you very much indeed, Convener. I'd like to comment very briefly on each of the letters. I'm, I'm grateful to all the people who have taken the time to write as a I thought Social Work Scotland, for interesting, provided some uh, very interesting information uh, as regards rural areas. I thought the fact that they were delivering the Caledonian system, which deals with um, perpetrators of domestic violence against women and girls on a one-to-one -one basis, I thought was interesting. Um, the, the third sector letter talking about some higher levels of engagement when you're using remote activity, but offset with some of the, the mental health challenges and the importance of face-to-face, -face, I thought was interesting. The other two, the um, Scottish Human Rights Commission uh, submission, which um, starts up the and the Children and Young Persons Commission, who starts by saying, I agree with the Human Rights Commission, I, I found very troubling, I have to say, and I would be very keen that we, we followed that up. When a body like the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and I hope I'm quoting them correctly here from my handwritten notes, uh, says, quote, some prisoners' fundamental rights are not being respected, I think you must sit and pay attention. Now, they, they detail a number of uh, factors. Um, the, the communication is available online, so I'll not go through all of them. But when we have statements like limited access to a lawyer uh, and the state's human rights obligations not being met, um, and steps that should be taken by the state, the state, albeit in a crisis, to ensure that impacts are minimised, proportionate, in accordance with the law. And similarly, with the Children and Young Persons Commissioner talking about um, some significant aspects, not least limited education and limited access to social work support, and also the fact that uh, there was no evidence that the rights of children were considered in the early um, release provisions. So that's something supported by the Howard League. Then um, I, at the very least, would want to write to the cabinet secretary about these uh, matters, um, because I think they are very important issues that are raised of fundamental human rights issues. Thank you, John. Rona. Um, yes, I, I mean I largely agree with, with with everything that John said, and I mean for me the um, the children's commissioner submission, um, there was a couple of concerning pieces in that. The, the bits that stood out for me were, were the fact where they say that uh, children and young people have been confined to their cells for up to 23 hours a day, and those showing symptoms of coronavirus are isolated for 24 hours a day. That's concerning. Um, family contact doesn't appear to be taking place, and uh, the mobile phones don't seem to have happened yet. So I think for me, those are the things that, uh, along with the things that John mentioned, that I found very concerning. So yes, I think. Uh, Definitely writing to, to the Cabinet Secretary um, and the Scottish Prison Service would be would be in order. Thank you, Rona. Liam MacArthur. Thanks, Kavina. Not much to add, Rona and John. I think I've covered it um, exceptionally well. Uh, I, I think, like them, I'm very grateful um, written into us and um, shedding light on, on on what is happening. And, and I don't think um, they've. Uh, uh, they, they've spared us some of the, uh, the, the alarming details. I, I, I think writing to the Cabinet Secretary and to SPS um, would be entirely appropriate. I think it would be worth flagging in particular some of the, the issues that John and Rona have, have uh, mentioned, but there are other issues within those uh, reports as well, which I think we would welcome a response to. 
Thank you, Liam. I also note that the Human Rights Commissioner is concerned about the lack of transparent and accessible data currently available for adequate monitoring of prison conditions and their impact. So I think given all the comments from members, um, are we agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service to ask them to respond to these quite worrying issues which have been raised? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is consideration of correspondence from Social Work Scotland and Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum raising a number of issues regarding the impact of COVID-19. I refer members to paper four. Do members have any comments or is there any specific action they would like to take? And once again, um, there is an option to write to the Cabinet Secretary to ask him to respond to the issues raised. Um, I don't see any requests for members to comment or um, state any specific uh, action. So, are we agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary to ask him to respond to the issue raised in this paper? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Right, we now move into private session that concludes the par public part of today's meeting. The next meeting of the committee will be on the 23rd of June, which will be stage two consideration of amendments of the Children's Scotland Bill. And also any follow-up scrutiny issues from today's evidence session uh, will be dealt with by correspondence, which will be published on our website. As previously agreed, I will now move the meeting into private session. I suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow for a comfort break.